It is too late. The evacuation still proceeds, but it's all theater. There are no lights inside the cars, no lights anywhere. And above him lives girders, old as an iron queen, and glass somewhere far above that would let the light of day through. But it's night. He's afraid of the way the glass will fall. Soon, it will be a spectacle, the fall of a crystal palace. But coming down in total blackout, without one glint of light, only great invisible crashing. Paranoid conditions are characterized by the presence of delusions. That is, false beliefs which cannot be corrected by adequate proof and which are not in accordance with generally accepted concepts. Delusions of persecution are most frequently encountered. The patient is convinced that powerful forces are opposing him and in the delusional system these often take the form of large and influential political or religious groups. On the other hand, many paranoids build a system around a neighbor, relative, or associate. Because of the seemingly miraculous effects of modern technical devices, such as radio, radar, television, and so on, they are often invoked as agencies of the unseen enemy, who has his special code of communication. I think of Pinchon as a cryptogram. We are almost, in a sense, code breakers. It's probably a better term than detective because he presents a puzzle that we are trying to crack. So Pinchon, in a sense, is an enigma, both in both senses of the word. He's an enigma because he's enigmatic, but also like the German enigma code, we are trying to break it. my experience that there are two Pinchons that exist. There is the Pinchon that gets up, has his coffee, maybe reads the paper, spends time with his son, spends time with his wife, and goes on with his life. I live in the world where I have another Pinchon, where the Pinchon is composed of rumor, people's recollections, archive records, newspaper articles. And from that we've created a composite Pinchon which works in parallel to his life. Going to Mexico City. Mexico City in the early 60s was a place of great intrigue. The New York Times described it at the time as the Casablanca of the West. Who knows what was going on in the shady dealings down there when Pinchon was there. In the end of September, October 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald went from America to Mexico City in order to get a visa so that he could go to Cuba. 
At this same time period, Pinchon was coming back from Joan Baez's house in California, where he'd been best man at his best friend's wedding, Richard Farina and Mimi Baez. Was he on the same bus? Was he making his way from Texas down to Mexico City on the same bus as Lee Harvey Oswald? Is this the secret that we don't know about? Is this what he's trying to say? Did they strike up a conversation? It's just ridiculous rumor, it's ridiculous speculation, but it's the type of fun that people like me can have. Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. Absolute panic. So all is connected. Everything we see is being connected. Don DeLillo says so. Pinchon says so. Literature on such a grand scale means that the connections that we can make are there whether they were even implied in the first place. A labyrinth of words and meaning and emotions. I got a call one day from um, the editor of the New York Times Book Review, Francis Brown, I think he was, his, was the editor at the time, and asked me if I would review a book by, a first novel by a young American novelist, uh, Thomas Pynchon. And I'd never really quite seen anything just like this. There's usually a quest involved. The quest in this particular book is, uh, the search for V. And V is a very elusive uh, character. I think she turns up first in his father's journals. But what is fascinating about the book, um, I think, is the vast knowledge of the writer. Uh, he knows a lot about astronomy. He knows a lot about physics. Uh, he throws his own verse in there. Uh, as I said in my review, I said I, uh, he's the sort of person that could turn out an almanac in a week. And it's a quality which possesses all of his books, uh, a huge encyclopedic uh, mind, and, and also with the ability to turn all this uh, together. Of course, I asked about uh, Thomas Pynchon, 
um, I remember the editor of the New York Review of Books told me, I think, only that he was a graduate of uh, Cornell. I do remember that, and that he was a recluse. That the last they'd heard of him, he lived in uh, Mexico somewhere, Mexico City, I believe. Uh, which added to the sort of uh, intrigue about this about this book. Uh, writers in this country usually um, jump on the bandwagon; they go on book tours and so forth. In fact, it's supposed to help the book a lot if you can go and talk on it about it on radio or on television. This man Pynchon uh, did none of that. He was tall, he's about six feet tall, he's taller than they, that's what I remember. He had black, black hair, he had uh, very white skin like his mother, uh, he had blue eyes. I'm, look, it's a long time ago, you know, and so, but I'm, pretty, I'm positive he had blue eyes. And uh, I remembered him as having a more English uh, nose, but now that I see pictures of him, I see that that's a trick of memory, that he was uh, more of like an Irish, sort of a cross between an Irish and an English nose, a little bit of a pug nose. And uh, he looked very much like uh, a New England character. You know, I mean, uh, that's the only way to describe it. When V was published, he was already in Mexico City. And uh, he, uh, uh, well, the review came out in the New York Times, and that aroused the attention of Time Magazine. And uh, they sent the photographer to, uh, to get his picture, to run with the review. And he evaded the photographer and took the bus and went to Guanajuato, which was about eight hours away in the mountains. All right, now why did he disappear in Mexico City? There are a number of theories that anybody can offer. And in the absence of his saying anything, they are merely theories and nothing else. And I haven't really studied uh, his life very closely like some people have. So I don't even know what he said on the record for. Now, as to what other motives he might have, uh, that's his secret. It's his story. And uh, I sometimes suspect that there might have been other motives. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, some of them, maybe some, maybe he was ashamed of something. Maybe he had done something and he didn't want his picture to appear. I mean, you know, people uh, do do those things. Or maybe he's just unbelievably shy, and it's the easiest uh, solution of all. Is he's really shy, he's really sensitive, he's hypersensitive, and he just didn't want people seeing his picture. It's clear that he thought that he was writing something subversive and revolutionary, that he even discusses uh, smoking marijuana, that he discusses secret plots, underground civilizations, uh, everything like that. Yeah. To a certain extent, those ideas were realities to him. And he was drawing a picture of American society at the time that he was talking about in an elliptical and symbolic and metaphorical fashion but that represented American society as he saw it. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, he might have thought that because he had written this, mm -hmm. he would be considered subversive, and therefore his life or his career would be in danger, mm -hmm. and that it was best for, he, for himself to stay out of the public eye as an individual because someone would come and get him for having done this.
green eyes, dark green, uh, beautiful hair, long hair down to, down to, to about a little past his ears, and it was very thick. But the thing that I noticed right away was that he didn't have a tan. He had very pale skin, which I don't care for. But that didn't matter because he was so interesting as a person. That's pretty funny. What a coincidence. Yeah, he lived in a in a very narrow street, and it was it was about as hilly. It was a little less hilly than this. One of these, these strange little places. It wasn't up that way, but it was right around like on this, about from this this uh, about from here to the beach. This looks like it. This looks a lot like it. My uh, old boyfriend, uh, he won the National Book Award and he's a famous author called Thomas Pinchon. Have you ever heard his name before? Um, I was wondering if you could do us a big favor and just let us look for like one second in the apartment. He used to live in there. and. Um. Today is not a good day. <laughs> just for one, just for a half a second. I just want to see if it's the same place. I, I, I can't really be uncomfortable letting you in right now. Not in, no, just... I mean... Okay. We'll go back and then, we'll, we'll go and then we'll come back later. But this is definitely the place that he lived. I know it because, like, here's the kitchen here, right? And there's a little bathroom right there, right? And, the, and then the bedroom's here and there's only enough room for the bed. See, I described the house. It's great. Do you realize how important this is? This is this is a historical moment. And I met Thomas Pinchon when uh, uh, <laughs> Jules was doing a story on the uh, Beach Boys, and we decided to go and look for Thomas Pinchon uh, just out of curiosity because, uh, not because of his writing, but because Jules, uh, you know, loved Thomas. He was a friend of his in college. So he loved Tom and he said, just at the spur of the moment, he said, let's go to Manhattan Beach and look up Tom. So we went there and as soon as Tom opened the door, I fell instantly in love with him and he fell instantly in love with me. So uh, we walked in, and it was very uncomfortable uh, for Tom and for me. But we we got through. We managed to get through everything because I had a lot of energy. I was only 19 years old. When he woke up in the morning, he would uh, he would come down here to the beach in the summertime, and he would stay here for two or three hours. But the crazy thing about it is, his skin was always white. He would never get tan. So we would, you know, we would we would uh, sit out here on the beach and we'd talk about the war in Vietnam. 
Well, Tom wanted to, uh, he wanted to go to Chicago uh, for the uh, demonstration. And we were talking about how danger, dangerous it was going to be and how the police were going to uh, beat up a lot of people. And I advised Tom not to go. And he felt it was his duty as an American to go and, and protest against the war in Vietnam. I knew that Pinchon lived in Manhattan Beach in the El Porto area, and um, er various people would, would talk about it, and um, uh, college students were coming in and telling me that they knew where Pinchon lived, and they were sworn to secrecy, and they couldn't tell anyone, and it just increased the mystery. And there was a high school teacher named Larry who um, came in and acted paranoid and would come up and whisper to me that uh, he lived next door to Pinchon. And, uh, and um, wouldn't say where though, and I didn't know where he lived. And um, so this was going on, and, um, and I didn't connect the two. I didn't, because there was a lot of people acting strange in the store. We had people that were stoned and people on acid, and, and, uh, and then of course well-known people who, who would be there for one reason or another. And uh, this was just a, the, a, the uh, sort, sort of the, uh, the feeling of the times. Everybody was paranoid. Yeah, well, see, these people were all attacked, uh, Ginsburg, Leary, and John Lennon. I mean, um, uh, and for the, the craziest reasons. Everybody had stories about being followed and watched, and uh, we had helicopters buzzing over our house. Uh, <laughs> with the big black ones with no markings. I called up the airport to find out who they were, and every, no, no one knew uh, what, 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 what was going on, and we still don't know what they were, but they were there. Um, I used to get followed uh, if I drove my car up to Hollywood to pick up incense from the Vedanta Society, and I was followed every time I went there by a man who was very clumsily in doing it. I mean, I could see him back there, and I'd go around the block and stop, and he'd stop, and then I'd go again, and he'd start up again. But, it, but apparently, he never followed me back. Uh, unless maybe someone else took over who was better at it, so I didn't see them, you know. You didn't do nothing, and been done before. We used to watch the customers uh, because we were wondering, well, who was, a, you know, who was real and who was a government agent of some kind. And um, this rather, this very tall man, about 30 maybe, was in there, and he was sort of lurking around, and uh, uh, he attracted my attention. And uh, he would come to the counter, and I'd talk with him, and uh, I wondered who he was eventually. And uh, one night in 1970. I, I came back from the Maui store and I got out of the taxi in front of the store and walked in and Richard was standing there behind the counter and I came and stood next to him and we started talking about something or other, probably pinch on, I don't know, I don't know for sure. And at that moment this strange man came in the door and Richard just turned red and ran out the back door. And at that moment I thought, oh, that's pinch on. Well, I never really saw this strange man after that again. But who I did see coming in there was a person in disguise that I thought was Pinchon's sister. This was a woman dressed in woman's clothes with a woman's Eastern-style suit on. Um, well, very low shoes, but same tall, same thin, and same lurky, suspicious attitude. Only it was dressed like a 40 or 50-year-old 40 or 50 year old woman in, in the last century would dress. I mean, it was such a strange getup. And I thought it was, I, I thought it had to be Pinchon's sister. 
because they, it was the same, well now I know it was the same person and it had to have been Pinchon in disguise, dressed up as a woman. The rhythmic clapping resonates inside these walls, which are hard and glossy as coal. Come on, start the show. Come on, start the show. The screen is a dim page is spread before us, white and silent. The film has broken or a projection bulb has burnt out. It was difficult even for us, old fans, who have always been at the movies, haven't we? To tell which before the darkness swept in. The last image was too immediate for any eye to register. It may have been a human figure dreaming of an early evening in each great capital luminous enough to tell him he will never die. He had... Uh a wide variety of clothes uh, in, his, in his closet, but they were all the same color. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> they were all the same color, and they were all the same price, and they were from all the same, uh, they're all Levi, made by Levi's. <laughs> Because he never went to black tie events when he lived in Manhattan Beach. He lived there for about four years just to write the book, the, uh, the, the new book, after V. So all he did, really, was he lived like a hermit. And he was working on Gravity's Rainbow and having a lot of trouble, as all writers do, with writer's block. And uh, he, he, he stayed up all night and wrote by hand. Long... Uh, hand, page after page after page after page, and then he would take all that and wait till it got a big pile, and then he would type it and edit it on the typewriter. When, when we would drive up uh, to uh, the gates, he would put his, his uh, sweatshirt over his head because he had a hood on his sweatshirt, and he would put his sunglasses on, and he would pretend he was in Germany in 1944. <laughs> he would hide himself. He was very dramatic, and uh, he was already uh, acting out uh, these these scenarios that he would put into his his uh, novel Gravity's Rainbow, which I thought was really fun because I knew it was part of the book. I knew he, he was he was making that comparison, you know, to the uh, the way we were uh, the aggressors in Vietnam and the way Germany, you know, was uh, the aggressor uh, during World War II. Mm. Christy and I were living together, and uh, the only thing is that she got really depressed about it, and I didn't know why she was depressed until, until she told me about it. And uh, uh, it did cast a tremendous cloud on our marriage, 
because she really cared a lot for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, she made up her mind at some point that she didn't want him. Mm -hmm. And that she wanted me. And uh, that's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. But the period between the, the, uh, the from the uh, beginning to the decision was very painful. And the, during uh, most of that, I didn't know what she was so gloomy about. Mm -hmm. But that's what she was pretty much so gloomy about. So the last time I saw Pinchon was when we came back to California uh, and uh, we were staying at a hotel on Sunset Boulevard, or a motel, the Ramit, Ramada Inn it was called. And uh, he came up and he was uh, wearing a black cloak, a black cloak, a cape, and he acted really mysterious. And he had a, like a pound maybe of this really, really good grass called ice pack and he had a big chunk of great hash and he smoked hash and um, wandered around and looked at things, which is about all you could do, if you know what I mean. The tremendous range of his learning, of his knowledge, whether it's the depth of it in any given area, but just the range of it, enabled him to build in to gravity's rainbow a set of uh, a sense of levels of worlds within worlds and uh, uh, to carry forward uh, the sensation of things are not as they seem you see the feeling of uh, being watched of being manipulated of conspiracies within conspiracies, of uh, uh, stories within stories, or of something that seems to be this, then turns out to be that, but maybe it wasn't that, maybe it was this, or maybe it really was that. I don't know uh, uh, when he would uh, when we he knew this, but I was quite convinced, very convinced, uh, uh, by I don't want to say when that uh, that this that that the CIA or some agency decided to use LSD to uh, uh, chemically psychologically bomb uh, the baby boomers. Be, and to just uh, just knock them out of uh, uh, out of action, and that uh, there's a lot of uh, suspicion that, for example, that Timothy Leary was a uh, uh, a government agent. I give the CIA a total credit for sponsoring and initiating the entire consciousness movement, counterculture events of the 1960s. In my opinion, is the general availability of LSD was a, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of reason to believe that it was a government program that got out of control. In other words, see, when you take LSD, the, they didn't occur to them that you become a free agent. Uh, and so uh, they thought of it in one way because they're the military, right? And, or control, and those who took it, it no longer were under control, or lots of them. And so uh, uh, the whole thing got completely crazy and out of hand. And uh, uh, whether or not Pinchon would have been aware of this is one thing. Um, how about if he was part of it, you see? And how about if Gravity's Rainbow represents the urge to confess, you know? And I'm not saying that this is the case, but those are the kind of speculations uh, that uh, that it leads to, you say. I, I didn't. I don't remember too much about that in the book, but uh, uh, I mean there are hints that he was aware of it, and how I became aware of it. The same way I became aware of it. You just put things together, you know.
от звука метронома. Между этими очагами постепенно возникает новый нервный связь. By the time he was writing in Lot 49 about LSD, he was ahead of the curve. But for people with an interest in science and people with interest in the underground, that sort of information was out there. Of course, the LSD that was being used at that time was of a much higher grade and was available for experiment for people like Timothy Leary, for government-backed projects. truly aware of Pinchon's relationship to illegal drugs. He's very aware of LSD's role in the development of subcultures, but he's also equally aware that this was created by government backing. LSD, which set free the hippies of the late 60s, was created by the government for military applications and was used against people in order for mind control experiments. So Pinchon's aware of the two sides, the free love aspect of drugs, but also the side which is much darker. And he delves into that going back to World War II and the development through the 60s in the American culture. Medical experiments, too, were standard procedure at many concentration camps. Experiments with poison bullets, aware that she was being given LSD? Yes, I mean, they, they uh, were told that they would be given some medication, uh, and they should have... Specifically sort of LSD? Uh, well, we told them, uh, I don't think that they would have even known what LSD was then at the time. They were told that they were going to give, they would be given some medication, which might make them feel worse. Dr. Manoa, what, what do you think the Army Chemical Corps was looking for in all of this testing? They were looking for an incapacitating agent, uh, an agent that would not 
harm the person permanently, but would incapacitate them temporarily. That seemed like a, a humanistic way to, <laughs> to wage a war, if war is necessary. Pinchon rails against the conspiracy. He sees the larger evils of the industrial complex, of the military, of the government, and the oppression of, the, of what he considers his people. But he also voluntarily joined the Navy, and he also voluntarily joined Boeing. Pinchon was involved in the Minuteman Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program. He was part of the problem, and I think he is aware of that. He was a man who can have radical ideas and may be railing against the system, but he was also born of that system. Information that he had in which he disparages the rocket program, Operation Paperclip, bringing rocket engineers from Germany to the US and then develop them into NASA and into the various aeronautical departments. <laughs> And I think that much of this in Gravity's Rainbow is there is a sense of guilt. It's a sense that science got out of control, military industrial complex got out of control. Thank you. 
he finished Gravity's Rainbow, and he left Los Angeles. There was a girl upstairs who was living upstairs in the apartment that we went to, and she left her husband and followed uh, Tom to Northern California. Uh, it was at, it was really Oregon, but it was so close, it was a place called Corvallis. So he spent five years with this girl. She finally got a divorce, but they, but they broke up after five years. And, and uh, he said he had a very terrible time between the time he was, uh, I guess he was about 39 by that time, between, between 39 and uh, 43. And he, he went off to New York. A screaming comes across the sky. It has happened before, but there is nothing to compare it to the now. It is too late. The evacuation still proceeds, but it's all theater. There are no lights inside the cars, no lights anywhere. And above him lives girders, old as an iron queen, and glass somewhere far above that would let the light of day through but it's night. He's afraid of the way the glass will fall. Soon, it will be a spectacle, the fall of a crystal palace. But coming down in total blackout, without one glint of light, only great invisible crashing. Well, I remember that when um, Gravity's Rainbow won the National Book Award, it was published by uh, Viking Press, I believe, and the um, publisher, uh, Tom Ginsberg, an old friend, um, on the occasion of the National Book Award, they used to have a big gathering, I think Carnegie Hall, and a big crowd. It was a little bit like the Oscars. They don't do it anymore because um, I guess it was too difficult to get people into the hall. <laughs> uh, somehow the magic of, of winning a book award hasn't got quite the panache as winning the Oscar for a film film stars and all that. But in, in those days they had uh, the ceremony, very much like the Oscars, in which the winner was announced. And the, uh, Tom was fairly sure that Pynchon was going to win the National Book Award, but he knew that Pynchon wasn't going to appear. And so in a wonderful bit of uh, imagination and cleverness, he got this wonderful uh, actor called Professor Corey so he came out onto the stage, and uh, Thomas Pynchon was announced, and a great roar of applause because everybody knew that uh, Pynchon was more or less a recluse, and to have him actually appear to get his award, everybody stared at this man, who then uh, proceeded to give a uh, acceptance speech. The jury has determined to divide the prize between two writers, to Thomas Pynchon, for gravity's rainbow, which bridges the gap between the two cultures and puts the world of manipulation and paranoia within the perspectives of history. I present this not to Mr. Singer, but to Mr. Pension. <laughs> accept this financial stipulation, uh, stipend, in behalf of uh, Richard Python for the great contribution and to quote from some of the missiles which he has contributed. Today, we must all be aware that protocol 
takes precedence over procedure. However, you say, what, the, what does this mean in relation to the tabulation whereby we must once again realize that the great fiction story is now being rehearsed before our very eyes in the Nixon administration indicating that only an American writer can receive the award for fiction. <laughs> I do want to thank you, and I want to thank Brezhnev, uh, Kissinger, Acting President of the United States, <laughs> and I also want to thank Truman Capote, and thank you. Um, and it, I guess he made it up himself because he was a, famous for doing this sort of thing. It sounds as though it is logical, but in actual fact, if you listen very carefully, it's not. It's nonsense. It's double talk. And uh, Professor Corey gave this speech, and I guess halfway through it, people suddenly realized that they were, there was a spoof going on. Of course, it got into the papers, and I've often wondered what Pynchon himself thought of it. I suspect he would have, in his way, just roared with laughter and thought it very much appropriate to uh, his situation in literature, at least as being known. So everybody knows. Some people probably thought it was Pynchon. I, mean, I don't know. You never, never can tell. <laughs> I uh, was approached by Herb Gardner to do a thing called Thieves. And uh, Herb Gardner is also a friend of Ginsburg. Or I forget how to pronounce his name, but he was the uh, commanding philosophy in the, in the Viking press. And being a friend, he asked, I understand from the article that I read, he asked Pynchon if it would be okay. And uh, Pynchon didn't know me, I didn't know Pynchon, so uh, since we didn't know each other, uh, there could be no uh, uh, responsibility as to uh, the identity of the uh, guy who was accepting the award, because they didn't know Pynchon, I didn't know Pynchon, uh, Pynchon, I wonder if he knows himself, but this is beside the point. Uh, it was a very, very interesting um, uh, assignment, but um, the fact is that when I, everybody thought I was Pynchon there, and I was beginning to think maybe I've been reincarnated. Gravity's Rainbow the second time, I decided that everybody in the world should read Gravity's Rainbow. And so, in order to make that easier, I thought if there was an index to the characters in Gravity's Rainbow, because there were so many characters, that it would make it easier for somebody to read it the first time. And I thought, I have to make it easier for some of my friends, or they just want to read it. Or just, you know, make it more user-friendly. So I um, basically... Uh, created an index. I read it this, uh, the second time and I indexed the characters and just kind of marked what pages they were on so that if you encountered a character and you, it looked familiar you could go back and see who. And I would upload it every once in a while and then somebody introduced me to the web in 1995 and I thought that's what this has to be. It has to be in hypertext and it has to explore his fiction that way. And so I made a, an early hypertext version of the Guide to Gravity's Rainbow, and then I kind of uh, went fanatical for a few years, and I and I did um, V, and I just kept. There was so much to do, and people were contributing stuff, and it just became this thing where everything was linking to everything else, and it became a gigantic labyrinthine site, which kind of perfectly 
echoed the, the spirit of the novels themselves in terms of its, uh, the way you kind of wormholed through the whole thing. I don't know, I guess he was born in the early 40s, but he's kind of a, you know, a post-World War II kid, and I, th I mean, just the, uh, the effect of the Nazis and, uh, and Germany on, uh, it was so powerful that it just created this, this kind of uh, powerful symbol or archetype in the culture that was kind of knee-jerk probably at the time he began writing, you know, uh, just these caricatures of Nazis and Germans. And uh, he, what, what I liked about what, what grabbed me about Gravity's Rainbow was I don't think it had been dealt with ironically at all or with um, any, I mean, just kind of given the pension treatment, you know, just tracing it back and kind of playing off of it and uh, uh, playing off of the, the cartoon stereotypes of Nazis along with, you know, uh, you know the mad German scientists. And I mean, they're just all in there. But then he, he traces back the roots of these, you know, it goes back through, you know, the, the through uh, Rilke and, uh, and back into ancient uh, German mythologies and, and just northern European mythologies. Back in the late 1970s, I read Gravity's Rainbow, and uh, after one day I was up to page 60, and the second day I was up to page 90, and the third day I was back on page 5, and by the fourth day I was in the library um, trying to learn more about what I was reading about. I was uh, enthralled, and uh, shortly after that, um, I mentioned this wonderful book I was reading to a friend of mine, and they said, well, Thomas Pynchon, I hear he's kind of strange. Um, and I heard my first Thomas Pynchon urban legend, although I didn't know it at the time. And uh, this particular urban legend was that Thomas Pynchon had been best man at Bob Dylan's wedding. And uh, noticed that photographers were gathering near the home, and so he had himself nailed inside of a wooden crate and wheeled into the wedding. And uh, that sounded just too weird. And uh, I needed to know more about that. And so that's when I went to the library to try and learn a little bit more about who Thomas Pynchon was. I use the standard arsenal of research techniques that are available to anybody that uses a library. and. Uh, I've managed to find out quite a bit. The problem isn't finding information about Thomas Pynchon. The problem is that there's so much that I'll never have time to collect it all. Pinchon lettuce starts at around $15,000 to buy. A photocopy costs 10 cents. In the Pinchon community, that's how we circulate them. Each one of them is priceless and is worth as much as the one that we're going to trade with. So through the letters, we get an idea of the unedited person behind the publishing facade. And it's pretty much the same person. His letters are 
typed out on manual typewriters, and he likes to use a graph paper. On my website, my background is a graph paper, so I try to impersonate the way that he writes. He has a very distinctive way of writing, which he has kept from the 60s through to the present day. The letters that I've seen of the 1990s are the same layout as they were in the 60s. He has a particular way of writing, which he likes to use print and also in script. But he tends to prefer print when he's signing out his name. And how many files you have, or how many papers you have here in this room? I, I never counted. I couldn't give you a, an estimate. I'd say that that pile there is uh, related to the Navy, and that's probably, I know that that's over a thousand pages right there. A lot that I have just in electronic form, um, and then there's some things that I keep in a safe place where they won't be disturbed. Um, it seems to me there was one other address. One, one thing we were talking earlier about verifying information. Oh, well, I'll just kind of close that. I don't think you need to film my, my work there, particularly since some of it uh, would need permissions. And Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. This is my personal main website. I'm sort of the uh, editor-in-chief of the Labyrinth. The site on Pynchon is called Spermatica's Logo. So this graphic and the name aren't my creation. These are the creation of my partner, Dr. Larry Daw. It takes the form of most of the sites that I run, Berto Echo, Borges, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, what we do is uh, take various quotes from Pynchon books using as links to different parts. Uh, we have a small biography. Well, I guess nobody has anything but a small biography on, on Pynchon. Uh, books of his translations and uh, all, uh, all the works Pynchon's done. Everything that he's ever written in terms of a paper or essay is on my site, which is probably illegal, but I, Thomas has not knocked on my door yet. And then the main part of our site is we try to provide some criticism of some of his books. When I read Pynchon, I don't only read him as a romantic, I read him as a person very influenced by science. And uh, I just see the zone, in my opinion, it's a quantum smashing chamber. Everything's been smashed. This is a small moment where all the energy is up in the air for grabs, and whoever can force their will on it the most is going to coalesce those particles, whether it's going to be the forces of quote-unquote good or evil or, or, or whatnot. And in my opinion, good old, good old Tyrone Slothrop does what we call quantum tunnels. Uh, quantum tunneling is when a particle, completely against all laws of logic, but it happens nevertheless, vanishes from the scene and appears somewhere where it cannot possibly be by logic. Th this happens all the time in, in subparticle physics. He vanished. He just left the zone. You know, he transforms into something higher, and he quantum tunnels right out of there. is that uh, I love that idea because all the possibilities are, 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 are collapsed in that time, you know? It's, to me, that whole zone is such a metaphor for Pynchon's writing itself because it's like the, the person who forces their own will onto that zone is going, to be, is going to be the winner. Some people see the rocket 
you know, the rocket becomes this sort of metaphor for, for either good or evil, what you're striving for. This image was too immediate for any eye to register. It may have been a human figure, dreaming of an early evening in each great capital luminous enough to tell him he will never die, coming outside to wish on the first star. But it was not a star. It was a falling, a bright angel of death. And in the darkening and awful expanse of screen, Something has kept on. A film we have not learned to see is now a close-up of the face, a face we all know. You have to work as a detective, but you have to understand that there's no final solution. You're not going to get the final answer which will explain everything. Pinchon's fiction don't, doesn't do that, and neither does exploring his life. A detective is clinically detached from the person. It's like a job. He was clearly aware that if he hid himself away from the world, somebody may try and find him. So what he did was he put in a, a, a series of moves that would stop this. With his last book, Mason and Dixon, he authorized himself a quarter of a million dollars in promotional material. His name was on posters, in ads on the radio. His name, he was putting it out. If this was a man who wanted to retreat and let the work speak for himself, he could have said no. He had carte blanche on how his book was going to be promoted. But he wanted the word out. So in this final act, it is the push forward. It may not be his face, it may not be his personality on talk shows, it may not be in interviews, but there is the final push. When it came out that there would be a new book, Mason and Dixon, um, of course we were all fascinated what was going to come out, and there was this high secrecy around the whole project, but there was quite a lot of the advertising, it has to be said, you would walk around town here in New York and there were Mason and Dixon posters in all the bookstores, there was a lot of publishing hype. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to write about Pynchon, I wonder if he's giving any interviews. I didn't expect him to give any interviews, but as a journalist, you always try. And I spoke to Pynchon's publicist, which is a rather peculiar position to hold. And she said, well, I'm Pynchon's publicist, but I don't do any publicity for him. But she did tell me there was an unofficial book party where a lot of Pynchon fans would be holding what was described as a Pynchon lookalike contest, 
which again is a rather peculiar idea because nobody knows or knew what Pynchon looked like. And so this story began really when I went down to this smoky literary bar in the Lower East Side, East Village, called KGB, for the Pynchon Lookalike Contest. And there was a great conspiratorial atmosphere in the bars, you can might imagine, and people were passing around this sketch. And then there was a, a man at the back who walked in in dark glasses and a white evening suit, or evening, a dinner jacket, not a suit, um, with a friend of his, and acted very peculiarly, stayed at the back, um, avoided the photographer. It was an interesting experience because there was one person who came in the door. Mm -hmm who looked very shifty. Uh, he came in, I think he was wearing, he was wearing some kind of white uh, Panama hat, and he looked very nervous. He was a little bit unshaven, uh, wearing sort of a linen suit. He came in, he in fact sat down where Mel is sitting now, and he watched a little bit, and we were all looking at him from the bar, thinking, you know, I think maybe this idea really got Pynchon out of his, uh, out of his house. He was curious to see what would happen. And at a certain point, he was aware that people were looking at him, and he got up and he no, left. It, it was right. worse than that. He, oh. was, uh, he was also wearing sunglasses. He was speaking in a French accent that seemed to be a very bogus French accent. And the moment someone took a photograph of him, he didn't merely leave. He fled the room. And the notion was that perhaps the imitator contest had actually compelled Pynchon to see what people thought. Um, and maybe the notion was a little bit beyond that, that he was ready to um, ready to emerge from his isolation, that he was tired of living in secrecy, that he wanted to be able to go out by himself and make reservations in his own name. Um, but when the camera was focused on him, the, the tension, the pressure was too much. So we developed the picture and we thought, well, you know, maybe, who knows, he, he, there are all kinds of legendary uh, stories about how he turns up at his at readings of his work and uh, incognito. So I thought, you know, we may have got lucky. We may have caught one of these, one of these um, appearances. So we developed the picture and to verify whether the picture was the right person or not, First of all, we compared it to the sketch, and it was uncannily similar to the sketch, actually. And uh, I subsequently learned the sketch wasn't at all like the real Pynchon, unfortunately. But um, I tracked down the, the former lover who had made the sketch, and um, I talked to her, and I, sp I sent her the picture, and I said, I knew that she would know the instant she looked at it. People don't change that much in 30 years. I said, will you just look at this picture for me? Tell me if you think it's Pynchon or not. And of course, she, it wasn't Pynchon. So it actually proved a lot simpler than I thought to find um, records of Thomas Ruggles Pynchon on the internet. It's got a peculiar middle name. It's also possible to establish where his previous addresses are because um, there had been obituaries in the local newspapers of his um, parents and uh, therefore I knew that they came from Oyster Bay, for instance. So when I found references to a Thomas Ruggles Pynchon and there was a reference to um, Oyster Bay, I knew I, that was the right character. And from then I was able to trace through the various other Thomas Pynchons 
until I got an address for him. So I put my wife's little point and click um, camera in my pocket, cheap plastic camera, just to be ready. And um, I went up there and I knew that Pynchon had a young son and I knew that Pynchon was around 60. And so I thought, well, you know, if, he, if, I, if he's around, I should spot him because there can't be that many 60-year-old men with eight-year-old sons. Actually, in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, there are a lot of 60-year-old men with eight-year-old sons. It's the truth. Lots. So I was jumping around all over the place thinking, there he is. No, no, that can't be him. That one, that one can't be him. And it was a sunny day on the Upper West Side. And suddenly there was this 60-year-old man tall, angular, almost pantomime-esque, his arms uh, gesticulating like a windmill with an eight-year-old son. And he was wearing an army surplus jacket and he was wearing um, blue jeans. And people don't change very much over 35 years. And he looked just like his picture um, when he was a young man in his early 20s. And so I, managed, I knew immediately I had my man. Very strange uh, sensation because, as I say, there are a lot of people, I, I, a lot of people around. And I fired off one picture. As I fired off the picture, I mean, it was a tiny little camera. I wasn't like you with a great big camera here. It's a tiny little camera like this. Just pulled it out of my pocket. But it had a flash because it was slightly dark. And he saw the flash and he said to his son, look, somebody's taking pictures. And he didn't really understand that I was taking a picture of him. And then he did, but after I took out the picture. And he had a hood and he pulled his hood up like that over his head and he closed the front like that. So there was only really a, a, a portion like this that was visible. So he obviously had a contingency plan for what would happen if there was a photograph taken of him. He took a right angle and disappeared. I tried to take another picture of him, but I wasn't... I mean, if I'd been a professional paparazzo, I would have uh, recorded his whole flight, frame by frame. Good luck! Good luck! Good luck! Good luck! But I didn't do that, because I knew I'd got one good shot. And um, so I left him, and he disappeared across the street, and then he stopped. And he uh, reunited with a woman um, who also had a, a, a child with her, who he had been with um, when I first saw him. And then they had separated. I think she'd gone shopping or something. And I thought, well, I'll go up and the reporter, as opposed to the paparazzo, came out at me. And I say, well, this, in my interpretation of the event, is the end of a long story. It's the culmination of um, a, a game, a meta game that's been going on for 35 years, the hunt for Thomas Pynchon's picture and Thomas Pynchon's effort to avoid being, having a picture of him taken. And I don't want to miss this one unique opportunity to let him have his say, to let him say s some words, since he's a wordsmith. So rather than just putting my camera in my pocket and disappearing, I put my camera in my pocket and I went up and tried to say hello to him. And obviously he was rather perplexed and agitated. And um, I didn't say anything because I wasn't sure how he would react. I just offered my hand as a handshake, as a, as a kind of, um, as you might do at the end of a soccer game. And he just said, get your fucking hand away from me. This is a photograph of Pinchon by a journalist called James Bone, 
who captured him on the street. Uh, the Pinchon you see in this image is not as sprightly, looks his age, and looks rather more startled than the one found by the CNN crew. But you think it's the same person? It is exactly, it is the same person. A CNN reporter came from Los Angeles with the sole objective of the film Pinchon. He staked him out on the street and they got the shot. There was much internal debate for CNN as to whether to show this and the final decision was made that although th this is a public figure, not in the understood sense of the world. So what they decided to do was they put this one shot, which actually lasts less than a second, in a montage of other people on the street. Then they told you afterwards that you had seen Pinchon. We're just not going to tell you who it is. The one uh, that I saw on uh, television, on CNN, or that I saw the clips of, they were not very convincing. But uh, actually, they finally identified uh, one that they said was him as a guy in a cap. But I really didn't think it was him. I thought it was another man. There's a man walking with like a, uh, his, uh, a very distinguished looking guy with gray hair and a little balding. And uh, uh, he's wearing a uh, suit, I think, or like a, a jacket. And uh, uh, you could show this as like the search for Thomas Pinchon. You know what I mean? Just like keep looking and looking. And now, here, see? If you, that's who I thought it was. Doesn't that look like a lot more like he would look, uh, or you don't know? Perhaps. The other one didn't look like him at all to me. But the, I don't have the other one. But. Maybe not. So here is the man walking down a street in New York City, totally unaware and almost ambushed by CNN cameras. What do you did to this uh, picture? You this image, this is a blown up image of Pinchon which uh, I digitally enhanced and slowed down dramatically about 20% of its actual speed. Recollections of people who've known him have said since the 60s this is a man who's always worn drab colors. As you can see that still continues. And for people like me who have a bizarre interest, we start to look at this information and we start to analyze it. We start to look for the code, we look for the meaning. So here in the pocket, we see a pen. Good news, means that potentially he could be writing. We look further at the pocket, there's an indentation. Now that could be glass, case for his glasses. Could also be a pack of cigarettes. But we look at the red cap. Here is a man who has been, if we are led to believe, hiding out from society. And yet, on the top of the brain that so interests us, there's a red flag waving. And we look at the insignia on the cap and we try and work it out. It's a large image. Is this a man saying to the world, I support this, support th this sports team? Is it a picture from fiction? Is it a cartoon character? It would be great if it was Porky Pig. But we just don't know. The other thing that we do is we look at the face and there's a look of surprise and shock and one of the concerns is is this the moment he's been waiting for is this the point where he says I've finally been filmed is there relief is there sadness is there regret is there anger and that we don't know the pinch on that we know in the fan community in the academic world in the journalistic world we're not sure they're his emotions and to be honest, we've invaded them. He 
he has the mustache. He's been cultivating the mustache since the early 60s. It's been described as both Pancho Villa meets Wyatt Earp. It's gotten longer over the years and shorter over the years, but it's still there. One of the characteristics that is most discussed when people have recollections of him are the teeth. These are teeth that have been called protruding, Bugs Bunny-like. May have been one of the reasons why this man has tried to stay out of public life. But the person we see today is not some sort of freak who's trying to hide from society. This is an aging hipster. Hands in his pockets, walking down the street with a sprightly gait. This is an interesting man. Kind of like spice, kind of like what did we do?